So to kick things off, welcome to the Special Purpose Operating System Working Group meeting. Uh, this is a CNCF working group undertake runtime. So we do follow the CNCF code of conduct. Uh, link to that is available, I, I hope, in our, uh, yes, in our agenda doc. Um, but basically, be good to each other. Um, I think we've had a couple meetings so far. Uh, if anyone feels like it, you don't need to, but if you'd like to do a quick introduction, um, I can start off and uh, let's just call the next person. If you don't feel like it, just say your name, pass on. Um, my name's Sean McGinnis. I work for AWS. I, I work on the Bow Rocket project. Um, I'll pass it off to Demetrius. Hello, uh, you can hear me, right? All right. Uh, yes, I'm Dimitris Karagasilis. Uh, I work for SpectroCloud on the Kairos project together with Mauro. So, Mauro, <laughs> you're next. <laughs> yeah, uh, Mauro here, also part of the Kairos project. Uh, and yeah, just uh, interested to get to know uh, what everyone else is doing, what, what the different projects uh, in this same kind of uh, uh, scope uh, are, are what kind of problems they are trying to solve. Um, yeah. Uh, what about uh, Felipe? Hey, thanks a lot. Uh, nice to meet everybody. Uh, I'm Felipe Wisi. I work for Unicraft and we work on Unikernels, which are basically extremely specialized virtual machines for the cloud. I can give a longer intro later. Thanks a lot. I don't know who's next. I'll just go. Hi, everybody. I'm Kyle. I'm with the Bottle Rocket Project. I uh, work a lot with Sean. So glad to hear what everybody's got to say today. Uh, who's next? Has Richard? Has I haven't, but I, I was going to introduce myself when I present, um, but that's fine. Um, yeah, I'm Richard. I work at SUSE. I've been part of OpenSUSE like, since it began. These days, I'm a distribution architect, kind of doing all of SUSE's special purpose operating systems. Um, and I'll be talking about one of them after this. Uh, next, Matthew. Yeah, I'm Matthew. I'm on the uh, Bob Rocket team, as well as Sean and Kyle. I think that might be everyone. Or did we miss anybody? I jumped in late, so um, let me let me. Oh, Victor, we gained Victor. Victor joined after me. Awesome. Um, so I'm not the last to introduce myself. Hi, I'm Tilo. Uh, I'm the um, tech lead of this working group. Um, I spend most of my time uh, maintaining Flatcar and uh, managing a team at Microsoft that um, helps with Flatcar maintenance. Um, yeah, that's me, uh, Victor. Oh, yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Trudeau. I'm uh, independent. Uh, just interested in learning at this point. Awesome. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'll put it in the chat again. There's a link to the agenda doc if you don't have that. Um, there's a section for attendees. If you feel like adding your name, please do. If you don't, that's fine. Uh, no pressure at all. Uh, and we actually have several items on the agenda today. So let's get started with that. Uh, first up, for uh, Richard Brown is going to give us an overview of micro OS. Yeah, and with slides even. So hopefully you can all see a slide. Yeah, looks yeah. good. Good, got it working first time. Wonderful. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about micro OS. So I've got 15 minutes. I normally blaze on about this for an hour. So um, I've done my best to pare it down to the, the key important parts. Um, luckily, I can skip past introducing myself now. So really, it's like, why did SUSE and the OpenSUSE community alongside it, like, make micro OS? And it's somewhat heretical to say, given how much money we make out of traditional Linux, but really, traditional Linux is not good enough in this world where we're playing with Kubernetes, Edge, IoT. You know, the, the, the analogy I use is, is, you know, traditional Linux is a wonderful Swiss Army knife. And really, you know, we're looking for much more precise tooling when we're talking about Kubernetes, IoT, and Edge. 
And yeah, yes, you can turn the traditional Linux into something very nice and precise, but that is a heck of a lot of work. Um, and quite often, you know, the the needs in these environments are, you know, exceptionally um, additionally demanding. Uh, the kind of example that we keep on citing because it kind of just sums up how, you know, you think of this as something nice and simple, like O2, you know, they had their cell phone towers, everything was a nice, simple, embedded, in, I think it was even an Intel CPU device in every one of their cell phone towers. And they thought, ah, no problem, regular Linux, let's push out an update to all of these machines. And in doing so, the update bricked the machines and bricked their update stack and bricked their AV partitioning rollback. So they literally had no choice but to send an engineer to every single cell phone tower of every single one of them. And yeah, you know, it's true in, in those kind of embedded environments. It's just as true when you're talking about, you know, a massive cluster multi-cloud, you know, the last thing you want to be doing is having some poor soul SSHing into nodes, trying to randomly, mass, you know, independently fix them or redeploying everything. So really the kind of key goals we were aiming with MicroS is having a very reliable update stack with completely hands-off, set it and forget it. Like, you know, automatic updating, automatic recovery, automatic healing if there's issues. Issues can happen because no, nothing is perfect. So at least keep the, you know, the expense of such outages as small as possible. You know, if, if a reboot can fix it, just do a reboot and basically avoid the need for, yeah, ever needing any manual updates. So put simply, you know, special purpose Linux should be set it and forget it. Starting with the setting it, um, we started with, well, yeah, you know, quite a lot of people out there doing this already are handcrafting their own images, you know, and it's a heck of a lot of work. And, and you know, you have lots of fun issues with configuration and lifecycle management, and they're never as optimized as they should be. Um, and they're a complete pain in the ass to keep patched, um, especially when you're doing pure image-based delivery, you know, that, that can get quite expensive in terms of bandwidth and transit costs and all of that, especially when you're paying for it on the cloud or yeah, over mobiles. So we're really going for the idea of having simple base images for whatever platform, whichever architecture that's, yeah, we support them all with micro OS. And then, you know, the idea is you don't configure it as part of the installation, you configure it as part of the first boot. Obviously, we support cloud in it because that's what most clouds use. Um, and ignition because that's what a lot of people use when they're not using cloud in it. Um, but also we found in both of those cases, you know, they're wonderfully structured tools. They've got all those fancy plugins, but they don't necessarily do a great job when you really want to kind of get down and dirty and tweak and tune the image to quite a you know extreme level. So we invented another tool called combustion. Kind of along I meant to go alongside ignition, hence the kind of pairing name. Really the idea is, yeah, you shouldn't need to have anything you can't do with those first two tools you can do in combustion. Um, just gonna skip right past that. Basically, it's a tool for running shell scripts as part of the inner RD. Um, so what you know, whatever you want to do, it does it as a, a transactional update, which I'll talk more about later, as part of that first boot. So even though the file system is read-only, it mounts a separate BTRFS subvolume, does all of those changes in that BTRFS subvolume. So you're not breaking the premise of being able to go back to a wonderful clean factory reset. You can always go back to that. Um, but also it makes the benefit of that another reset point here. So you can go back to the vanilla micro OS image, or you can go to your combusted micro OS image. Um, configures it all on the first boot. Um, an example here would be, you know, creating a CNCF user, yeah, messing around with a few different partitions, adding some files to those partitions, adding an additional RPM package, something like that, and then yeah, tidying up everything afterwards. Of course, realizing that not everybody loves shell scripting <laughs> and not everybody loves ignition. So alongside all of that, we have a 
Fuel Ignition, which is basically a nice, base, nice, easy web-based tool for generating your ignition and combustion config. It can even make your kind of um, sidecar image. So when you're deploying it, you know, have a USB stick with, with that image in there and away you go. So you don't really need to learn anything. You can just click, click it all in a web UI. And that's basically the set it story of micro rest. Then the important part is forgetting about it. Once it's deployed, we have our transactional update stack. The main sort of driving premises behind it was being more lightweight than any sort of image based, AB partition based approach. You know, we want to be minimizing bandwidth use. We want to be using up, you know, distribution packages where it makes sense. So you may deploy the system image, but then, you know, handle the deltas as distribution packages. And above all things else, of course, never affecting the running system. Anybody who's run a traditional Linux can, you know, probably tell horror stories of, ah, I was just installing this Debian package and, you know, the package manager decided to reboot my X window or whatever. And yeah, my entire desktop environment disappeared. Transactional update structures itself in a way where all of those updates are happening in a separate BTRFS subvolume. So the running system is never touched, running files are never touched, you know, running binaries are never touched, no services can restart, blah, 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 blah. Um, so it all happens in a much less risky scenario. All of that includes, you know, being pedantic about making sure it's done atomically and perfectly. So any errors in the uh, package manager at all, calls the entire snapshot to be thrown away and it never yeah might as well never have happened um any changes that pass any of the automatic testing fail again snapshot gets thrown away um only if everything is perfect does that snapshot then get marked as in essence the next boot target so you know your system is is perfect then you effectively have a newly composed image in a btfs sub volume waiting for your your next boot and then you boot into that. Um, so yeah, doesn't matter if yeah network goes down, whatever. It's it's incredibly resilient. And then even on that first boot, yes, we know the image the sub the snapshot was composed perfectly. Yes, we know all the RPMs were perfectly fine. That doesn't necessarily mean they're doing everything perfectly. So if there's any issues detected on that first boot of that new snapshot that new snapshot immediately gets thrown away and you boot back into the, the one that happened previously. So, you know, any outages as short as a boot booting up to realize something's gone wrong and go back to the, the previously good boot. Um, just because this confuses people when we talk about microOS as a read-only root file system, but it's BTOFS, what we're talking about when we say the root file system is really the parts where the distribution own the files. So in essence, USR is the kind of key one. Everything else, fancy UFI partitions, SRV, root, OPT, home, et cetera, is all basically considered out of scope of the operating system. They're separate DTFS subvolumes. Therefore, you know, any third third party, as we were saying, but any, you know, any Kubernetes platform, any user can do whatever the heck they want with these. It doesn't get snapshotted. It doesn't get rolled back. It's, it's their data. It's their stuff. We, you know, and in, you know, we should not be packaging anything in there. So, you know, a lot of the concerns people have of, you know, RPM packages bumping over user data doesn't happen because we basically kind of treat our bit like an image and we treat everything else. Yeah. As not our business which yeah, does make our life an awful lot easier too. Of course, there's one annoying bit there that um, <laughs> is of course ETC, the configuration. Um, that is an imperfect situation because of the nature of everything upstream these days as well. You know, ideally we do our best to not package any of our distribution config in ETC at all. You know, for example, like system D already do, right? So the distribution config goes in USR. Um, we actually have, we introduced the idea of a USR ETC for similar things as much as our stuff as we can. We've moved to that, 
but there's still some stuff which you know needs to be in etc to boot the system at the beginning of yeah beginning of the first boot um so we handle the whole thing as overlay fs alongside and integrated with those snapshots we're doing so an rpm package can update a config and will potentially update a user's config to upgrade it to whatever it needs to be but that is all snapshotted separately. That can be all rolled back separately. The user can treat ETC as if it was read-write at all times, and those happen at overlays automatically. So it's all transparent to the user until something goes wrong, and then it auto-heals as part of the regular transactional update auto-healing. So yeah, it's it's a compromise, but it's a compromise that's proving incredibly resilient while, while we are slowly working on getting all of our stuff out of ETC. And of course, because this is a CNTF uh, discussion, you know, the thing is ready for Kubernetes. A uh, teeny bit of history lesson, before MicroOS, there was a project called Cubic. Um, Cubic was actually an OpenSUSE Kubernetes distribution. Um, and MicroOS kind of ironically span out of that to be a more general purpose, special purpose operating system. Um, so yeah, now these days, it's MicroOS is still going, Cubic isn't. But all of the Kubernetes support is still there, still maintained, still working wonderfully. Um, and also the nice thing with it then is it also means we are sort of Kubernetes distribution neutral now, you know, K3S, Rancher, whatever, whoever, we don't care. They can plop it on top of micro OS and it'll work fine. Um, your tra tra traditional configuration for transactional update would be to have the updates downloading automatically. Um, but of course, like I say, they don't apply until they reboot. You don't want to have a Kubernetes cluster where your nodes are just randomly rebooting. Um, so transactional update conf can be configured to use cured. So the transactional update, when there's been a download, signals your Kubernetes reboot daemon. So the cluster controls when it reboots. And so you've still got that whole set it and forget it premise. You just have to have cured running on your Kubernetes cluster. Um, and yeah, in a nutshell, that's micro OS really, you know, meant to be predictable, immutable, reliable, more, um, yeah, uh, more efficient than image based or AV partitioned systems while more flexible. So you can have, you know, A to Z instead of A, a to B for, for handling failures. And yeah, Kubernetes is one of those jobs that it was doing since it began. So I think that knocked through my 15 minutes perfectly. So does anybody have any questions? Hey, I got a question. Great presentation. Really, I like the way you did some things here, um, both in the presentation and in the software. You said one of your, I think it was minimal bandwidth was one of your goals. Could you talk more about like maybe why that that's a goal for, for you? And is there some sort of pressure from people who use it that they want like you mentioned like cell towers was there restrictions in bandwidth or what does yeah. it mean by that so when we, we were thinking well we've def we've had customers um where you know they're doing things like deploying k3s in a factory environment on the other side of the world on a network they don't control because it's a customer's network they, they bought the factory line and put it on their site so yeah, you know, customer doesn't necessarily have great uplinks, doesn't necessarily have a reliable link. Um, so once the impact of keeping all of that OS nodes to be as small as possible. Um, also another case of, of like having a, a Kubernetes cluster running on a train. <laughs> so, you know, trains moving down the line, yeah, you know, yes, it's got a network connection, but you don't want to be downloading, you know, multi gigabyte images even even once if you can avoid it. That's really interesting. And I have one more question. What's the relationship between micro OS and rancher OS? Because I, I know that that was a thing that Susan was doing, and I don't think they are. Could you? Yeah. Okay. It, um. <laughs> I'm trying to find the diplomatic way of putting it. There's been lots of experiments in this area, some of which were overlapping. Um, that was one of them. Um, these days, things are are better aligned. Um, so, like I mentioned, you know, microOS is meant to is aiming to be you know sort of use case neutral. So, not doing cubic, for example. So we can run any Kubernetes on top. 
And alongside that, Rancher now has their uh, Elemental Toolkit, which is basically a bunch of additional tooling to manage Micro OS or SUSE C Micro, which is the commercial variant, um, in a, a, a slightly more interactive way. So um, in, in their case, with their model, because if you think of, of Rancher, where you've got your Rancher dashboard, you know, so you've got a Kubernetes cluster that is a bit less maybe set it and forget it than I presented and more, you know, customers wanting to manually control everything. And therefore, Elementor has sort of APIs plumbing into that to orchestrate things a bit more directly. Okay, I think I got it. So so basically, micro OS is kind of what Elemental will uh, sit atop. Yes. Uh, or vice versa. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks. Very nice presentation, Richard. Uh, great to see you again as well. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to ask, you were mentioning that at the time of uh, upgrading the system, if something goes off, you just roll back to the previous um, booting system. I just wanted to understand whether this meant just validation that the uh, upgrading process finished, or is there any additional verification of what was installed or, or signatures or anything like that? Thanks. Yeah, all, all, so all of all of that, um, because that's regular sort of RPM management, right? You know, any any package of failing any checksum check or any signature check or whatever, you know, that would count as actually reason to throw the entire snapshot away before the reboot even happened. Um, and then in addition to all of that, so we, we know we've installed the packages, we know they've got the right signature, we know they come from the right repository, et cetera. Um, then on the first boot, we have a tool called Health Checker, which does some very basic checks by default for things like, you know, did every system deserve a start, um, but also can be expanded to do any kind of check you want. So for example, some customers will use it for, you know, did their Kubernetes cluster, you know, did, did this node join the Kubernetes cluster that it should have joined? Um, and therefore, if any of those tests failed, then that boot is considered a failure and the thing walks back. So you've, you've got sort of validation on the installation and on the results of the installation. Did the thing, you know, who cares if it installed perfectly fine? Does it actually work? <laughs> Very cool. Thanks. Just a quick question on the um, Ignition support. Uh, what Ignition versions, what language versions do you support and what do you use for, like, do you have a tool uh, like um, uh, Container Linux uh, compiler or Butane to translate YAML into Ignition JS? Yes, um, we support Butane. Um, I can't remember exactly which version of, of Ignition, because to be honest, I just use combustion for everything because I love it more. Um, yeah, but I, I I would imagine, yeah, I don't know. I'll be, yeah. I, I just With... like the fact that you're using it and it's available because that kind of makes um, at least three um, specialized operating systems ignition let's say ignition compatible and it makes it easier to to reuse work that what we're doing in that um, in that sector and i like it yeah exactly and 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 the you know the the real expectation for, i mean i use combustion full stop but the re real expectation is you would do everything you can in ignition and then combustion is there to be the extra shell script at the end for the bits that ignition can't do makes sense thanks Anybody from anything else? Uh, I have a more basic question. <laughs> um, no I'm a, yeah, I'm a physics major, but I didn't really learn computer architecture, which I'm reading uh, recently. Um, so mm, now there's um, just the, the special OS discussed in this group. Seem, oh, it seems like a real-time operating system. And also the, 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 the web assembly stuff that's going on is all about uh, abstraction of the compute layers, right? So, um, what's uh, so? So in the past, of course, um, you know, minimize the OS is the way to go. Uh, but do you think uh, what going forward? What what is? Uh, it might not be just for, for you, just for the group. I guess what is what going to be the trend going forward when it comes to like abstractions? Should should like for example, WebAssembly, you can even run it directly without an OS. Um, Oh, like 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 you know, embedded sort of. 
So what's what's the the I guess trend for the abstraction? How did I make that question clear? <laughs> I'll take a stab at it. I mean, I'd say with what we've learned with MicroRask, that's you know a couple of years old now, and we've got Sli Micro, a commercial product based on it, is uh, stuff like WebAssembly, you know, may work wonderfully fine in the cloud where you've got you know cloud provider of your choice and every you know, you know image of your choice and everything's already out there. And then when you start dealing with uh, sort of different Processor architectures, you know, ARC64 and, you know, embedded devices and, you know, all more complicated real world deployments of, of yeah, things like, like the factory example where, you know, you've got a customer like literally sort of shipping factories to their customers and wanting everything in literally a container going on a boat for six months and then coming out and magically working on the other side. Uh, that those kind of real world demands then suddenly, you know, having an operating system with more flexibility, able to plumb in additional services into there, you know, add extra stuff. So when that thing boots up, it auto discovers everything it needs to, et cetera. Then, yeah, that's that's where that works. But someone else has a hand up, so I will stop this. Just adding to that, I think um, it's it's important to understand kind of the the level in in the in the stack. That, that we're talking about. And um, I believe as far as most of the um, operating systems in this group uh, uh, are concerned, we're kind of seeing ourselves below uh, the abstraction layer of WebAssembly. Um, in, in, in Flatcar, we're handling WebAssembly like just another Docker, so to speak. Um, it's, it's, it can be part of our contract to the upper layers that we can uphold and guarantee this is something that will always work. This is something that that uh, that's always going to be there, and that's uh, that you will always be able to use. But you know, the lower levels you wrap entirely. Like this is what the operating system abstracts. Um, and so, as a part of this abstraction, it's it's not only the kernel anymore. It's also the plumbing level, and then features like auto updating. Uh, what we're what we're discussing here. So taking this as a whole stack, I would I would put WebAssembly definitely. Um, above the um, the items that we're discussing in this group, so this is if, if this if this makes any sense. Uh, uh, just to add to that, I, I think I agree. I just want to say that the, the whole problem everybody's trying to solve is the the life cycle. So you, whether you remove the OS layer or not, you still have something you want to update, and that would always be your app. So how you put it. Uh, on on the machine to run it on a on a real machine is what the OS provides. But the the problem with embedded devices is that the booting process, if you can call it that, is not standardized. So you can of course build a lifecycle using uh, the normal booting process of a Linux distro. Uh, you can hook into specific uh, points in in the boot process and do stuff. Atomic operations, right? But for an embedded device, it's I think it's a pain in the ass how you do that because it's not standardized. So where exactly do you hook, right? Something failed. What do you do? You don't have a device. You bricked it, right? And I think that that's what the US is going to provide and it's a bit hard to get rid of. My understanding, uh, listening to some of the WebAssembly talks about computerized uh, WebAssembly uh, being proposed by the, the Resum Cloud folks uh, seems to be that like going forward, they are able to sort of um, kind of handle the, the different component needed when running in, embedded uh, and also kind of interoperable as well. So if that does come true, what does special OS play in that picture? I mean, if, if you look at the greater picture, um, rebuilding that into the WebAssembly runtime will basically end you up with a system uh, comparable to the operating systems that we're discussing here. And then the WebAssembly folks will join this working group and they have their own specialized operating system, right? I mean, that one of the focus um, of, I think, every representative uh, this operating system in this group is to highly specialize to do one thing and one thing really, really well, um, which is what you uh, will end up with if you add 
um, this this functionality that that uh, the operating systems here are providing uh, to a new custom custom stack like like WebAssembly. Oh, so so you're saying that the WebAssembly is is, is going to work across different platforms? It's the OS layer that become more uh, specialized for a particular use case, right? WebAssembly is a very specialized use case for an operating system, right? And um, the OSs that we're discussing in in this group can be, um, I think, amended in a way uh, to be that specialized layer. Uh, I think multiple operating systems even have presentations on that um, in past uh, WebAssembly conferences. I remember at least Flatka and one other. Um, so folks are already having the idea to kind of um, use the high spe specialization of the layers that we're providing um, to build a stack that is minimal and just runs WebAssembly. There's oh, okay. also multiple people running uh, Wasm in, in different Unikernel projects, and there were some Hacker News uh, items popping up uh, recently. I, I think even from an OpenSUSE engineer on a weekend uh, also, by the way. Okay, thank you. Great. Well, thanks, Richard. That was, that was great. Um, we may have some more time at the end for Q&A, but we have a few other things on the agenda yet. So uh, let's let's move along to the systemd, sysext, and sysupdate uh, overview. Uh, oh. Hand over to Tyler. I'll share my screen. Um... Okay, let's do it that way so I don't need to go into full screen. Uh, you folks are seeing the the presentation. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, this will be a quick one. Um, uh, so none of what I'm telling you today will be on a test later. This is to get you interested um, and to get you back to this presentation and to ask uh, qualified questions later. All right. So we love system D and Flatcar uh, for reasons that will become obvious um, really soon. It just is a perfect match for our operating system. All right, so what is a SUSEXT? Um, SUSEXT is a image-based Linux operating system extension. It um, is uh, managed via a systemd tool that ships with um, more recent systemds, version 248 and above. Uh, 248 came out in July, July 2021, so it's pretty widespread by now. Uh, the image-based extension can be merged uh, into slash USR or slash opt or both, um, that depends on what the SysX ships. So in a SysX, there's only, even, even though a SysX is basically a snapshot of a root file system, um, directories that will be used from a SysX are only slash USR and slash opt, like everything else is ignored. Um, there is the same kind of uh, mechanism for ETC, and those are called configs. Um, it has its own update concept. It plays very well with system deep sys update, uh, even though that's a separate tool. But these two are made for each other. Um, so uh, I have it in the in the presentation as well. Okay, so you want to set out and build a SysX. Um, how do you do that? Well, you start with a um, um, subdirectory that represents your target's root. Uh, you put, um, as it's basically standard by uh, by build systems nowadays, you just roll out all of the all of the libraries and binaries for like one specific tool that you want to ship in a in a sysx. You roll that out into the subdirectory. Um, you add some versioning information. So uh, when system D sysx applies that sysx on a on a target system, it knows what architecture is it for, um, what uh, distribution is it for, what re what release version of that distribution needs to be matched, and of course all of those can be wild carded. Um, so that's kind of a little bit of dependency tracking. Um, SysX that do not match uh, any of those with the running um, operating system are simply ignored. They're not, they're not merged. OK, and you take that subdirectory and you either create a plain tarball from it or a file system image using MCAS, uh, squash FS, whatever. Um, or you can even generate a whole uh, disk image with um, following the discoverable uh, disk images specification of the UAPI group. Um, and in that case, you have the opportunity to enrich your SysX with meta information 
uh, like a DM Verity hash in a separate partition or, or different labels or different partitions for different architectures. So you can uh, you can ship kind of a fat uh, SysX to your to your systems and then you end up with a single file and that file then you can ship. All right, now you're on the target system and you have your SysX file. What do you do with it? So you can either copy or soft link the SysX image into either ETC extensions or run extensions or varlib extensions. Um, plain directories uh, under those path, paths uh, or symlinks into plain directories um, are supported as well. So if you ship a tarball, you can just unpack your tarball anywhere on your system, and then you soft link basically the root entry point of um, of that directory you are, you uncompressed your tarball in into etc extensions. You run system resources merge, and it will magically appear into your slash usr or slash opt depending on what your sysx ships. Um, I already mentioned system resources merge, so you run that. It combines all of the sysx that um, system defines in the search path paths that I mentioned above. Um, and uh, it, um, it it basically uh, compresses those into one single overlay FS mount. This overlay FS mount goes to slash USR, slash opt, or both, depending on what is in your SysX stack. Um, of course, if you have system SysX unit activated, then this will happen at boot. So you have your tools available uh, very early in the boot process. Um, if you change something on a, on a running system, like if you copied down a new SysX and you soft linked it or brought it into ETC extensions, then you run system SysX refresh and um, the SysX will atomically be refreshed and use the, the new version. This comes in handy uh, later on when we talk about updates. Okay, then let's talk about updates. This is a separate component. It is not made for... Um, updating systemd sysx files. It is made for updating general files. It's called systemd sysupdate. It's a relatively new component, but it integrates extremely well with systemd sysupdate, uh, systemd sysx. Um, so in order to you know, uh, understand, for, for systemd sysupdate to understand which version of a file is newer than a version that is present, um, it follows a simple versioning specification. And in the configuration files, um, for the uh, respective updates. Um, you can use pattern matching. Um, so you can basically build the, the semantic versioning of whatever um, SysX or releases that you want to update. For instance, like following the, the previous example, if we have built a SysX called foo.raw, um, in this example, a simple squash FS, um, you can version it uh, by just naming the files foo-1.0.raw, foo-1.1, uh, and so on. And we can soft link the respective version that we want to use into ETC um, extensions as plain foo.raw, and it'll be used. OK, uh, so update supports multiple sources. You can use local files. You can use local partitions. Um, for instance, the butterfs partition can be used to pull an update from. Um, if you use HTTPS, then systemd sysx will look for a file called sha256 sums, and that um, is supposed to list all of the SysX that are present on the server uh, with respect to checks, checksums uh, next to them. This file can optionally be signed with a signing key, so uh, with a GPG key, so uh, Sys, uh, SysUpdate can check whether that SHA uh, file is actually valid, and only if it's valid, use it. it you can also force that this file needs to be signed in your, in your update configuration um, to be on the safe side for supply chain security. Um, so that's the source, and the target is basically just a plain path to your um, to your file. In our uh, example, to um, the system resource file system image, uh, and just extending on that foo example. Um, so, assuming we have all of our files in slash opt slash x, um, and there's where all the all the raw squashfs files lie, then um, sysupdate will download new versions there. Um, and it'll create a new soft link in ETC extensions. And then in a the custom unit, um, you should probably uh, run systemd system uh, system uh, refresh. So your, your new version is, um, is applied. You have a configuration directory etc sysupdate 
um, and it's a basic uh, configuration file syntax where you can define your update sources, um, your target files, and kind of other um, parts of the of the update process. Okay, so how it's being or orchestrated? Um, the kind of the kind of orchestration that we envision it on the on the flatcast side is we ship a base image with base functionality and um, SysX and SysUpdate functionality um, that can be extended uh, and customized by user config. So the user basically specifies um, sources for their uh, SysX that they want to use, um, pipe that into the provisioning logic uh, when provisioning an instance. And so at provisioning time, the, the final customized instance uh, is being composed. And then after provisioning finished, um, the user can use uh, like any base OS with um, a custom SysX layer on top. There are obvious benefits to that. Um, for us, the biggest benefit is um, Flatcast a read-only immutable and cryptographically checked uh, operating system. So it can't be extended and it's not supposed to be extended. However, SysX gives us the opportunity to, gives users the opportunity to add new features to the operating system um, to like a large degree. Um, it comes with its own update story, uh, so it allows um, users to provide their own updates for their own SysX uh, entirely decoupled from operating system updates, and that's really nice to have, I think. Um, it's pretty flexible uh, to distribute SysX. You can either bake it into your operating system images before you um, before you uh, distribute your provisioning images, or um, you can compose it at provisioning time, or basically any any uh, later point in time. And um, any changes, any updates, or any rollbacks are uh, applied atomically um, by just switching the overlay FFS, overlay FS mounts. There are drawbacks um, that are most uh, important for general purpose distros. Um, if you apply a SysX, it will to, uh, it will turn USR uh, and opt or both, depending on the SysX read only and the minute you type um, system D SysX merge. That can be pretty painful for distros that just need to write into USR, general purpose distros. Um, it doesn't hurt Flatcar because USR is read only anyways. It's on a DM Verity protected partition. So um, we're fine with that. But you know, if your operating system has the expectation uh, for, for these to be writable, that obviously is a showstopper. There's work underway to change this, at least in some um, in, uh, to some degree. Um, in the UAPI group, we have proposed uh, a um, extension to the specification for mutable SysX, and we're actually uh, taking on the implementation in the next month. So this is coming to system D SysX. There will be an option of mutable mode in the future. But um, even that would uh, imply that um, uh, there's an overlay of as mounted on top of USR, which again uses USR as writable uh, destination. And that has limitations, for instance, if USR is mounted, uh, it is itself a separate partition, then this won't work. If anything is mounted below USR, that will disappear because the overlay uh, FS only works with one level of, um, of uh, file systems below it. Um, so those limitations will remain. And also it requires a recent system D. So if you're running an old Red Hat, uh, you will not have this functionality. Um, before we close, uh, I've collected a few sample applications um, for SysX that are in use today as I speak. Um, first of all, um, Flatcar um, currently uses SysX to extend its base image, which is the same for all of the clouds, for all of the vendors that we support via a vendor-specific SysX, and that in turn um, delivers the vendor-specific uh, image that we run, optimized, for instance, for AWS or for Azure or for any other cloud. So vendor-specific tools uh, like um, the AWS agent or the Azure agent, stuff like that, is in the SysX on top of the base OS, and that allows us to have the same base OS, uh, the same image um, for all of the clouds that we support. Um, we use it to make Docker and ContainerD uh, customizable. So we even shift, shift uh, Docker and ContainerD in separate SysX that are applied at runtime. And this allows users to just you know, remove the soft links 
to those SysX from uh, from etc extensions, and then those uh, container D or Docker versions won't even be present in the file system, and they can basically uh, add their own customizations um, that they want to use. We have um, presentation online uh, from the latest WasmConf, where uh, a, a WASM enthusiast basically used SysX uh, to extend Flatcar um, to uh, run a WASM stack and a WASM application on top. Everything was composed at um, provisioning time. And uh, so it was basically one deployment. And then the, the whole WASM stack came up. Um, that's that's kind of a demonstration for the customizability that you have of, of SysX. And of course, uh, it had its own auto updates, uh, independent from the Flatcar operating system updates, uh, which were also demoed in that uh, presentation. And lastly, and it's probably most interesting for um, a CNCF audience, uh, we're currently looking into proof of concept of using um, basically this kind of uh, composability at provisioning time to add um, support for cluster API uh, worker nodes to, to operating systems that haven't been prepared for that. So cluster API uh, providers, for the people who don't know, um, they currently require you to build your own image based on a base operating system image uh, with some added Kubernetes features using a tool called Image Builder. And then you're supposed to host your own image, and only then you can provision uh, cluster API Kubernetes clusters. And we want to kind of move that um, to the um, uh, provisioning time, um, and at the same time decouple um, the operating system and Kubernetes components. Uh, right now, there's an exponential uh, version metrics that um, uh, cluster API providers need to support, like version ABC of the operating system and version one, version one two, three of Kubernetes, um, that gives like nine images in a result. Um, decoupling that will not just allow uh, to update operating system and Kubernetes independently, it will also break this uh, version matrix and make it linear. Uh, we have a demo of that in the Flatcar office hours. We're currently um, working with the Cluster API OpenStack team um, to make this happen. And uh, it might be an interesting option for specialized operating systems that support Ignition, but currently don't support cluster API. Like there's a high chance this work is reusable for those operating systems. Over to Kairos. Um, Dimitris, you wanted to share how Kairos uses this text. Yes, thanks, Tilo. Uh, actually, you pretty much described everything. I uh, was planning to show um, a demo of what you just described pretty much. And also, uh, so in Kairos, we don't use it so much to build the, the OS. Uh, but rather to allow users to extend it. I think I'll just start. Uh, how, how much time do we have? Maybe I can skip the, the demo of the thing. Maybe uh, let me try to share my screen. Share this. Do you see a screen? You see a screen? Yeah. Oh, OK. Let me move these things away. Can I move them away? Anyway. Um, OK, so there is a link um, in our docs that describes how this works. but. Uh, the, the general idea is that we you can either do it at, at runtime while the system runs. Uh, uh, like Tilo described, you can have a, a container image uh, which you simply extract in varlib extensions, and then you can have your own things, uh, let's say, installed under a user or opt. Uh, so you can either do it after installation or you can do it through the config. We haven't presented Kairos yet, so some concepts may not be uh, familiar yet. But anyway, this is how you set up uh, the, the Kairos installation. So we have a thing called bundles, which are uh, actually container images. Uh, there is an example of how you can prepare uh, one, uh, for example, a very simple um, uh, bundle for, for Kubo. Uh, Kubo is an IPFS implementation. So all, all, all this one does is it puts uh, in a scratch image, just user being uh, IPFS and the needed uh, files to make it a CSX extension. Uh, if you recall from Tilo's presentation, you must have a file there uh, with some version IDs and such. Uh, and this is pretty much all you need to have a basic uh, extension. Uh, and this allows our users to decouple the, 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 the life cycle of ex extensions, their own binaries, things they need on the image from the OS itself. So you can update your OS uh, without having, so you, you can update the extensions, your binaries, without having to rebuild the base image of the OS and vice versa. 
So just to see how this works, maybe it's interesting uh, to see what Ilo described. So I have Kairos running here. If I was to uh, touch user being uh, my my exec, for example, uh, you'd see it's a read-only file system. But if I was to do it with uh, varlib, I already cre created the dir, so in varlib extensions. Uh, by the way, um, this directory is uh, persistent in Cairo, so it survives reboots, so you can put your extensions there. I created a deal called my ext, which has user lib with this file you need, uh, just to show the, uh, maybe I should do, uh, the terminal is a bit broken because of QMU, but um, our lib extensions, user lib extension, that. So uh, you see, this just has two IDs, and these have to match uh, what you have in as release. Oh, sorry, maybe I should limit that to something with version in it. So you see my version ID is 2204, which matches what I had in the extension file. Same thing for ID somewhere. There it is, Ubuntu. Uh, and that's the reason it works. So if I, if I did uh, a reboot or just to make it quicker, system D, C, S, X, to refresh, like Tilo described, uh, it's already there. Um, oh, yeah, I didn't show you what it has, though. Um, so this has a var lib extensions in bin. All it has is a, a, a script which echoes this text here. So I now have my binary because it's in user bin, my binary, right? Uh, so I have it there. But if I was to disable the extension uh, on merge, I think it's the command. It's gone, so my binary is no longer there. Um, it looks there because I have to has R to forget it. Um, okay, it doesn't, doesn't know it exists at all. So it's gone. And this survives uh, reboots. So it's a very um, uh, simple idea. Uh, you can put anything you want in there, uh, libraries and such. Uh, and it has its own life cycle and it's container based. So by using bundles in Kairos, um, you can have your own pipelines, different repositories and all to build your extensions, make sure they're updated and all, uh, which is updated also, which is updated can also be useful there, uh, but that completely unties that from upgrading your uh, operating system. Um, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's it, I think. If there are any questions, feel free. <clears throat> Well, we are running kind of long, so if, if mm -hmm. folks don't mind, if we could uh, maybe do follow-on questions and things in the next meeting, just want to make sure we have time to uh, give Unicraft a little uh, enough time to to show uh, their part and then hopefully talk a little bit about KubeCon EU. So let's uh, pass it on to you, Philly. Okay, thanks a lot. I'll just probably take two, three minutes, uh, no more. I'll just share my screen. Um, I mean, I don't know uh, how many people here know what an actual unikernel is. It's basically a fancy term for a specialized virtual machine where you try to put the lines of code that a particular application needs to run and nothing else, right? So if you could sort of customize, hand customize the operating system to only have the lines of code that a web server like Nginx needs, and then that Redis needs and so forth, and all those images could be fully specialized and then wrapped in a nice virtual machine such that tools like Chemo and Firecracker and can run them in a standard way, that would be the, the ideal case. And that's what a unikernel tries to do for, for cloud deployments, right? Uh, and Unicraft is one such Unikernel implementation. It happens to be a, a Linux Foundation open source project. Um, and it has these uh, three principles, one to be fully modular so that it makes it easy to pick and choose the things that you need. Um, the other characteristics of a Unikernel is you tend to uh, do things like dead code elimination at, at compile time before you deploy. So you get rid of a lot of code that way as well. Um, we kept the Linux API for compatibility, so it doesn't require modifications to applications or languages. And then we spent time doing tooling integration so that uh, you can do kubectl type commands that underneath end up running a, a unikernel. Uh, so that's like a one minute introduction. I know you guys have uh, sort of slots to introduce projects a bit better uh, throughout the week, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll do that at some point. Um, 
you, you can go to unicraft.org for a few more, a bit more information. So Unicraft is both sort of the operating system and tooling and a development kit. So you can put such unikernel images together. And then we do some performance measurements just to give you a very small taste. Um, like th this is called boot times of an Nginx image on top of Unicraft. So um, on the on the x-axis, we have the number of running instances. So these are full VMs. And then you have the boot time on the left. We boot one, we measure it, we leave it running. We boot a second one, we measure it, we leave it running. And you can get consistently boot times of a few milliseconds, right? Six, seven, whatever it may be. And then if you run 5,000 of them, it shoots up, but not too much, uh, between 10 and 15 milliseconds. And then we did a, a fun stress test. We said, okay, uh, let's dump as many of these instances as we can until the server dies. And then you can get uh, close to 100,000 instances on a single server. So that's it uh, for Unicraft in two to three minutes. And I'll be happy to take questions or provide a somewhat longer presentation and maybe a demo at some point later. Please do. <laughs> okay. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, we can follow up in the Slack channel, but uh, I think we we do have a current rotation of, of projects, but um, so it looks like we wouldn't be able to to get Unikernel on the or Unicraft on the schedule until probably February um, sometime. But whenever that'd be great to to go more in depth. Yeah, just just I don't know if you assign me or if I write an entry after the last one. Uh, just let me know how it works. Yeah, if you'd like to, uh, yeah, feel free. Just add yourself there. Okay, awesome. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Thilo, do you want to talk about KubeCon EU? Uh, yeah, thanks. So this is just something that bubbled up, and we still have a bit of time. So uh, I think at least one more office hours where, where we can wrap up planning. But um, yeah, I'd be interested in at least floating the idea uh, that we hand in a panel there, a panel discussion of all the specialized operating systems would be probably interesting, would fill a lot of time. Um, and would uh, kind of expose our projects to a larger audience. They could ask questions, uh, things like that. Uh, we'd be well prepared because by then we'd have um, uh, wrapped up all of the presentations. So everybody knows each other and uh, our, our strengths and, strength and goals. So that would be uh, great to have, I, I, I think. Um, yeah, maybe, I don't know, I start with uh, creating a Google Doc tomorrow and then point you folks at it. And then we can just start collecting ideas. Uh, I think deadline is the is end of November, is the thirty first or so. Let me check. Yeah, if we had a doc, we could start collaborating on something. That's a great idea. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. the one thing that comes to mind is uh, I'm. I think they limit the number of people that can be on a panel, so we may just have to figure out who would actually be able and willing to participate as an actual panelist. Yeah, that's true. That's that's true. I'll um I'll put a respective part into the into the doc as well so we can plan for that. Um but yeah awesome. Uh happy that uh, there's um there's a strong interest in having that. Let me check the call for proposals and then we jot down the, the 26th of November is the is the, the deadline. So we have one more office hours until then. Cool. And if we could do some async uh, in the Slack channel and, and in a Google Doc, and uh, then we could finalize. Yeah. Great. All right. Um, maybe along those lines. So the deadline for the um, FOSDEM dev room has passed. And the deadline for announcing the FOSDEM dev rooms has passed as well, and the rooms have, haven't been announced. We actually, we're still sweating a little and crossing our fingers a lot um, that the image-based Linux dev room will work out. I'll, I'll keep you up to date on the on the Slack channel. I think we made a pretty good proposal for that, so the hopes are high. Yeah, fingers crossed. Awesome. That'd be good. And if it doesn't work out, I mean, I'm assuming the distribution's general dev room will get accepted, and I'm sure they would like a lot of Yeah, absolutely. It's just, it was nice to have the dev room last year, and yeah. it, was, it was crammed, so it would be exciting. But yeah, distributions always works. That's true. Distributions or containers, both, both are pretty fine.
Oh, well, we fit in a lot in this meeting. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. We, we're a minute over. Um, yeah, I, I kind of wish we could keep going on, but uh, I think we should probably wrap things up. Um, love to see other conversations happen in the Slack channel. So if anyone has any burning questions or anything like that, uh, I think most of us are around there in, in Slack. Otherwise, next meeting in a couple weeks. Thanks, everybody. Good to meet Thanks. you again. Great stuff. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.